G'day everyone, welcome to Lubrication Explained. Today we're going to talk about micro-dieseling. So this is a failure mode both of lubricant as well as equipment. We often see it in hydraulic packs. One thing I want to do is distinguish it from cavitation. So sometimes people think that they're the same thing, but cavitation and micro-dieseling are two distinctly different but similar failure modes. So let's get into it. Alright, so let's talk about micro-dieseling of lubricants. The easiest way to understand it is to think of an actual diesel engine. This is really going to help us understand the process by which uh, micro-dieseling happens. So the key thing about a diesel engine is, of course, that there is no spark, right? The ignition is caused by the compression of the fuel-air mixture, right? So that's one of the key differences between a gasoline and a diesel engine. It's the way that the fuel-air mixture is combusted. That's going to be really important when we start to talk about micro-dieseling because you can take these principles and just shrink them down to a much smaller size. Now, where does this happen? Typically, it happens in hydraulic packs. And we might want to unpack why that's the case. So it happens around the pump, right? Because if you think about the compression stroke on a diesel engine, what's happening is effectively is the air fuel ratio is going from low pressure to high pressure very quickly and where does that happen in a hydraulic pack it happens at the pump so the suction side is at low pressure and of course the discharge side is at high pressure and that's really the purpose of a hydraulic system is to transfer that high pressure to an actuator and turn it into mechanical work now when you have micro dieseling, it usually is recognizable by some kind of pump noise. So you'll hear noise coming out of the hydraulic pump that is very unusual. It sounds almost like someone is gargling marbles. That's how I've heard it described before. It's a very kind of clattering sound. And when you hear those pump noises, that can lead to vibration and then surface damage and ultimately failure of the system. Now, just having pump noise itself is not necessarily uh, a sign that you have micro-dieseling because it could really be two things. It could be cavitation, which happens on the suction side, or it could be micro-dieseling, which happens on the discharge side. So let's talk a little bit about what micro-dieseling is specifically, and then we'll be able to see how it differs from ca cavitation. So in a previous video, we talked about reservoirs and we talked about the fact that there is dissolved air in lubricants. It can sometimes make up about 7% of the total volume of lubricant is actually dissolved air. So just like salt dissolving in water, it's not visible. There's no particles, there's no air bubbles or anything like that. It's dissolved and it's in solution. We want to distinguish that between the, sec uh, between the second and third types of air one of which is entrained air, where we have bubbles which are within the bulk volume of the lubricant. And then, of course, we also have foam, which sits on the surface. We're not going to talk about foam here. Now, why is dissolved air and entrained air so important to our understanding of microdieseling? Well, it's all got to do with gas solubility. So one thing that we know is that gas solubility increases with pressure. So if I increase the pressure on the fluid... I can put more gas into solution. Now, that might be a little bit difficult to, to sort of get our heads around. So the easiest way to think of it is any kind of carbonated beverage, whether that's beer, soda water, can of Coke or Fanta or whatever. Think of, of, of this. And what is happening is that we have an equalized pressure between the headspace and the gas that's contained within the bulk liquid. So it's in equilibrium and it's actually a dynamic equilibrium because there's gas that's going between the liquid volume and the headspace and then there's an equal amount of gas going from the headspace back into the liquid volume. Right? That happens in the soda bottle as well. And typically in a in a carbonated beverage, that headspace is about 3 atmospheres. It's just approximate. Now, what happens is that when you open the lid, it's going to equalize with the atmosphere outside, which is obviously at one atmosphere, and all the bubbles are going to get released, because remember, the solubility decreases as you decrease the fluid pressure, and then it's going to equalize out. So after some amount of bubbles have come out, then the pressure is now equalized between atmosphere 
and the liquid that's in the bottle. So that exact same thing can happen in hydraulic packs. So if you were able to completely seal off the headspace, right, whatever that pressure is at, it is at equilibrium with the dissolved air. And if we were able to reduce the pressure in the headspace, right, thus decreasing the solubility of the liquid lubricant, then bubbles would come out of solution and they would turn into entrained air. Now, why is that specifically important to microdieseling? Well, one of the places where we have lower pressure than the rest of the system is on the suction side. Now, hydraulic packs are designed for this scenario, so we don't see microdieseling everywhere. It's designed so that you see low pressure on the suction side and high pressure on the discharge side. But where could we have abnormally low pressure on the suction side? And generally that will happen if there's a restriction somewhere around the reservoir. So maybe the suction strainer is clogged. And so we're having to pull more suction on that suction line. That lowers the pressure on the suction side of the pump. Maybe the breather is you know, plugged or it's not as allowing as much air in. Or even if the inlet line on the suction side is somehow there's a, a, a decreased radius or something because it's pinched or there's deposits that are in there. All of these things can contribute to lower pressure on the suction side of the pump. All right, so now that we have reduced the pressure on the suction side, we have reduced the solubility of gas in the lubricant, and therefore we have, now have entrained air in our lubricant. Now, what's kind of typical? We're not pulling that much suction on it. It's not like we're going to a vacuum. And so we're probably a little bit less than atmospheric pressure. And a hydraulic pack might run anywhere between, let's say, 40 and 60 degrees. So just have that in your head. That air bubble is then obviously going to travel up to the suction side of the pump. And at the moment, nothing has changed. So what's the key? Well, as that air bubble goes through the pump, it gets compressed, right? Because we're going from a, a low pressure to a high pressure scenario. And it could go up to, let's say, 170 atmospheres. Um, I'm not doing this in PSI or KPA just because it's, it's much easier to give the order of magnitude that it's being compressed. Now, what's important about that? Remember that when we compress gases, we have to look at the pressure to volume relationship. And so I'm going to take you back to high school physics now, and we'll talk about Carnot engines and adiabatic cycles and things. So on a pressure volume graph, you'll remember that there were these isotherm lines where, uh, you know, going from blue to red is increasing in temperature. And when we compress something, we are going along the lines of constant, well, they're called adiabats, which go between the isotherms. Now, when you compress something through a pump, it is mostly going to follow along that, that adiabat, which means it's going to jump from a lower temperature to a higher temperature. Now, why do we say that this is an adiabatic process? Because adiabatic processes apply generally to you know, ideal gases and things like that. So what we mean by an adiabatic uh, combustion process is basically that we have you know, an, an air bubble, and of course it's in lubricant, and it's getting compressed, and that compression happens so fast that there's no real opportunity to en for energy to escape the system. So there's no um, heat transfer from the bubble to the lubricant that's outside. And because it happens so fast, we basically consider it a closed system, and it approximates adiabatic compression. We sometimes use these... Uh, assumptions when we're talking about diesel engine compression as well. So what is going to happen then is we're going to get a huge increase in temperature. It's That bubble is going to go to about a thousand degrees Celsius or, or somewhere in that ballpark. And what happens at a thousand degrees Celsius? Well, the air and vaporized lubricant is going to combust. Right At that kind of temperature, you're reaching com combustion temperatures. And um, of course, what happens when you combust hydrocarbons, you get oxidation, right? So it's gonna accelerate the oxidation of the hydraulic oil. You get oil darkening, right? 
because that's a that's a byproduct of oxidation products. You get particulates, so that's what's contributing to the oil darkening. You remember with diesel engines, when they combust fuel and lubricant, you get soot as a as a byproduct. There's often uh, uh, uncombusted uh, carbon residue. Well, in a in a diesel engine, that either goes into the lubricant and into the fuel sump, but those lubricants are designed to handle those, so they have a lot of dispersants in them, or they end up going out in uh, the exhaust. Well, here in a, in a hydraulic pack, there's nowhere for that soot to go, so it's just going to load up the hydraulic oil. We'll also get increased temperature. So if you have these tiny micro pockets that are coming out at 1,000 degrees Celsius, that heat is eventually going to dissipate into the rest of the hydraulic oil. So we'll get increased oil temperature, and we'll get thermal degradation. And if any of these mini explosions happen on the surface, on any kind of metal surface, but most likely on, on the pumps, then it's going to incur surface damage. And that's why micro dieseling can be, can be so damaging to hydraulic packs because it affects not only the oil, it damages the oil, but it can also damage the equipment at the same time. So that's why it's really important to understand the mechanism by which it happens, um, where to look for it, and how to troubleshoot it. So remember, it's all about trying to uh, increase the amount of pressure on the suction side by removing restrictions on either suction strainer or on maybe the breather or something like that. All right, I hope that's been helpful um, as a bit of an explainer for microdieseling. As usual, if you have questions or comments, please leave them down below. This has been Lubrication Explained.